Greetings, everyone. How, how are you this afternoon? I know your cardio is really going. We had a, a, a good walk over here, and so our brains are really going to be working in high gear because they got all kinds of oxygen coming in. I want to thank you so much for being here. I also want to let all of you know that how much we appreciate those of you that who have worked your way towards the, the front of the room. Um, when you're the presenter, you want to be able to connect. And um, Katie wants to make sure that she can look you in the eyes and just imagine what those smiles are looking like behind those masks. So again, we appreciate your being here. Uh, I'm Paula Daniels, and I'm the president-elect of NASPA, so I offer greetings to you for the whole conference, and um, you have no idea how pleased I am that everyone who made it to New Orleans was able to be here in person once again. Give yourselves a big hand because you got here, and you are going to be better off because you were. Give yourselves a big hand. Uh, Katie Gardner is the author of the best-selling book, Secret Stories, Cracking the Reading Code with the Brain in Mind, as well as several other popular teaching resources. She's an internationally known keynote speaker, author, and literacy consultant with 30 plus years of experience working in classrooms ac across the US and Canada. Her practical and proven methods for bringing neuroscience into the forefront of literacy and learning have been shared in both lecture and panel discussions at Harvard University and MIT, and have been the subject of numerous professional journal articles. And now it is our honor to present to you the renowned speaker, Katie Garner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you also to everybody for moving toward this uh, area. I appreciate that. That helps so much. Um, I have trouble focusing myself. And so I promise today will not be boring. It will go very fast because I want to just stuff so much into what we're going to talk about today. Um, but part of what allows me to do that is to see that you're right along with me by watching your faces and seeing you either go like this or like this. And that's why it's helpful if you're close enough for me to see you and my contacts don't make that really easy. So thank you so much for uh, being in this front half of the room. And I really do appreciate that because nobody's back in the very back. So we're going to get started. And I'm going to tell you right now that what we're really going to talk about, it's another layer of what you may be hearing a lot about right now which actually are two different things, but science of reading as well as culturally responsive teaching. And that layer is really connected with the neuroscience, using it in a way that it, it, um, goes beyond how our brains learn to read and extends into how we actually learn, how the brain learns. That's kind of been a missing piece in the conversation um, that we've, at least depending on what state you're in, have been privy to over the last year and a half of, as we've really kind of taken note of what we need in our, um, in our systems for reading, um, what we need to make sure our kids are getting. And when we look at our kids, we mean all kids. You know, that's a, a real issue with reading is there are a lot of obstacles that kids can face depending on the doors they go through to access these skills. And different kids sometimes need different doors to go through. When we look at the brain science, it really carves a beautiful path, knowing what we know about how the brain learns to read and how we learn to learn. And it's that path that we're going to really look at, this backdoor pathway that's built on neuroscience. And the, the interesting part is the connection between teaching in alignment with the brain system for learning and how that parallels so perfectly to culturally responsive teaching. As we're looking at how the brain learns, that's our common denominator. So when we're trying to find the door that's most easy for all to pass through, neuroscience is really going to paint that picture um, the most clearly specifically the area that we're going to look at today with early brain development and struggling readers as they move into upper grades. Now, I will tell you this session's going to be really short. I don't do our sessions except for this conference because it's so hard to fit in why we're doing what we're doing and make sure that I'm really filling up what you need alongside 
how to play with it and how to streamline the approach that you're taking. And to do all of that and kind of pull it together, it takes a little bit longer than an hour. So continuing the conversation is um, gonna help tremendously to help, it's gonna help anchor or entrench a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today, uh, not just as concepts, but also as you start to, to use this in your classroom or share this at your school, and then have questions. Um, so this Facebook group you can find, it's on your download that you'll have access to through um, the, the app, but I'll show you another way that you can access it as well, in addition to a big handout packet. Your handout packet's gonna be gigantic, which is why what I uploaded to the site is only a one-page pack, because the one you're gonna download has video clips, it's got this whole session presentation, and on it, there are these little clickable links that I'll show you as well that go to different research pieces, as well as resource pieces that are free for you to download, including anything I share or show today. Um, but this Facebook group, if you wanna just access it via Google or on Facebook, if you just search, um, supporting reading science with brain science, it'll pop up. You'll be able to find it, um, or you can use the links. And you can also follow on social media or post pictures from today, and there will be some um, drawings that I'll share on my social media this evening. Now, what I do want to also mention, and I'm actually going to back up here, this is something I'm not going to get to talk about as long as I'd like to, but I want to throw it out there, and this is going to correlate with where your handout packet is, um, because as I said, you can access it on the app, or I'll show you a way to get to it from anywhere so that as it gets updated, which it's constantly updated, especially as new science emerges and, and ways to trim the fat on our approach can, can shift. Um, I'll show you how to access it. But the reason that I wanna make sure I tell you about this particular slide is because if you teach K1, 2, or high ELL populations, can you raise your hand? Okay, if you are not a teacher but you're an admin um, or support person either as a literacy coach or district person, can you raise your hand? Okay, who teaches above third grade or is in a school setting above third? All right, and what about SPED at any level? Okay, that gives me a little bit of breakdown. Well, if you have kids who come to you and they don't know individual letter sounds, one of the ways we're gonna cheat the brain is looking at what doors are accessible. Again, it's always about common denominators. What doors are most easily accessed for the most population? And when we look at how the brain learns and the brain system for learning, that really gives us our best end. So one thing I do wanna make sure I direct your attention to, and you'll see it first and foremost in your handout pack, is something called the Better Alphabet Song. It's the fastest way on the planet Earth to give, not teach, to give every possible thing a letter can do by itself. Now, that's not the focus of what we're gonna talk about today, because what we're gonna talk about today are these bigger picture points. But it is something that's a huge tool to have in your pocket if you teach, let's say, kinder, and your entire year is sucked up by trying to teach individual letters and sounds. Especially since you can't do diddly squat with individual letters and sounds. Now, if you don't teach kinder, you may not know this. <laughs> but you cannot effectively read almost anything if all you have for the letters are the individual sounds. Those are the least likely sounds they're going to make in actual words where letters come together and have entirely different behaviors. So the problem with having your whole year sucked up doing that means you're not actually getting any value out of the reading and writing that's happening all year. Because kinder is reading and writing all year. They just don't have anything to read or write with. <laughs> so they're just kind of going through the motions, holding the pencil, holding the book, checking the box, saying they did. But if you don't have not only what letters do when they come together, but even all the letter sounds themselves, what are you really reading and writing? I mean, think about it for a minute. Like the word how, huawa. The word the, tahai. The word her, huera. Like nothing makes any sense. So it's, it's not even scraping the surface of the value that we want kids to take away as we engage them naturally with reading and writing across the day, which we do already. That's already happening. In every classroom, kids are engaging with text across the day. The question is, what do they bring to the table to engage with? Like the brain is a pattern making machine. It's always trying to figure out what it brings that connects with what it sees and how those, how those kind of breadcrumb trails can be followed. If there's no breadcrumb trail, you're doing a lot of work for very little gain. So all I wanna mention is the better alphabet accesses muscle memory, not cognitive processing. So it's our first example of cheating the brain, finding these backdoor access routes that for kids from all different 
cultures, areas, language backgrounds, learning um, experiences or background of home support. Regardless of kind of where or whence they came, we all share certain common denominators that are part of our brain system for learning. Muscle memory is, we're gonna look at early brain development, what areas are our ends and what areas we have to work like a chess opponent to um, kind of circumvent. But specifically, early uh, brain development shows that muscle memory is far earlier on board than is any sort of executive higher level processing. So we can feed or front load certain things in so that the higher level processing center is ready for the transfer that's needed to make sense of what's happening across the day. Now, muscle memory, I will say, I'm gonna give you a warning. You always have to cheat, you always have to treat the brain like a chess opponent and know if you move this way, it's gonna move this way. One downfall with muscle memory, typically, if you think about a song that you know from the 80s or from the 90s, and you could sing it in your sleep, but you don't even know you're doing it, your brain can go on autopilot. So that's not the best situation when you're trying to decode text. You can get around the fact that it goes, oh, and by the way, when it goes on autopilot, that means you have to sing the whole song. Like if you're singing something like 12 months of the year, right? And if you're not in kinder first, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but I promise I'll get off this part in a minute. But if you're singing a song to remember the 50 nifty states or the 12 months of the year, you have to sing the whole song if kids can't remember what comes before July. And it's very frustrating. <laughs> and that's because the brain will take in anything that is, anything that is muscle memory based is going to be a read only disc in the brain. It exists as a whole and you'd have to start from the beginning and sing to the part you need to let your lips, tongue and teeth spit out what you're trying to remember. If you know this about the brain, you can cheat because you can chop it up into 26 mini songs. So you'll hear, as you're gonna see a couple of slides that are just gonna show you how fast this works, because it's really the first example of where we're gonna head in this bigger picture point. But you will hear that it is not one song sung all the way to A to Z, it is repeated on every single letter sound pattern. So that kids who can't remember what a letter says can sing right on the letter and the sound pops right out of his mouth. And it's not just one sound, it's every possible thing a letter can do by itself. Because C doesn't just say K, it says S. G doesn't just say G, it says J. Y doesn't just say Y, it can say E and I. And I'm not talking about phonics. I just mean the individual letters. So kids have to have instant access with that so that that can rise like a flood while we start playing in the other direction we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the hour. And it's the power of two. It's, it takes two to tango. Gotta know what the letters say, but you also have to know what they do when they get together because that's all part of what we experience across the day. And as we look at all this through the lens of kids coming from all these different backgrounds, um, that's where it, it gets really powerful to see how important this neuroscience piece is. So what I'm gonna do first is just tell you to find your download pack, you're gonna see it on your app. You can also go to either my speaker website, which is katiegarner.com, or to thesecretstories.com, which I think is up there somewhere. Um, either one you go to, look for the workshops tab, and in the dropdown, you'll see session handout packet. It's easy to go through your app as well, but if you wanna come back and access it in three or four months and see what any updates are to the links, you can. Once you do that, you'll be able to drag it to your desktop. You have to do that to activate the links. The links are all embedded into the slides. They're not giant like those, they're small. Those are just an example to show you that they're there. Um, but once you click on those, one of them is gonna show you the better alphabet. So if you're in kinder, you're in first, you have yellow kids, please access that, watch that, and then jump in and start doing it with your kids. So you don't take up any more time than you need to to get that done. This little one, and I'm going to stop her from making this noise until I can read this. It's a, this, a teacher actually sent this and she uploaded it to this Facebook group, but she said, in September this week, kindergartner was still four, was not able to give me any letters or sounds. We sing the Better Alphabet song every day. I would even hear her singing it uh, when the kids were partnering. Fast forward to the first week of November, and it does take about two weeks to about a month, two months at the latest. Um, that's how long muscle memory takes to own those sounds. Uh, now listen to what she can do. Can you hear her beautiful dialect? There's a second language spoken at home. All I want you to see with this is how we can circumvent these, these areas that may or may not be reliable for instruction and take advantage of these other aspects, other areas of the brain to get it in. So I'm gonna let this, it's like three seconds of a clip. About this one. Hey, says. A says but you can also say a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a
ti ta 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 Okay, now that, that was not the song. That was her doing the bits from it. You'll hear the song when you click on and you can take it all, do it, use it the next day. But this was just a random letter sound assessment. What you didn't hear was what the brain normally would need, which is a moment to think and recall. If this were coming from the higher level cognitive executive processing center, she would have had to think before she gave you the sound for the letter that she saw. What you saw instead was it being retrieved through the lips, tongue, and teeth. There wasn't a hesit, it just, so she sang. The letter name was forged in the brain to the sound that it made. Like you singing a song or kids singing L M N O P. <laughs> Somehow those letters became glued together into one because their brain wasn't thinking about it. It's their lips, tongue, and teeth leading the way. And the brain is not ready to lead the way necessarily at the earliest grade levels where this is done. Now this gives you a little taste of what the actual song sounds like. I just love this clip. A B C B B B B B B B B C C But it can also say. Now, that's pre-K. Two sounds for C. Are they ready to use it to decode to encode? Nope. Do they have it? Will the brain now understand if they see a word like circus? And I don't mean see it as in they're going to be reading it. I mean the teacher's reading a big book. And they think C is supposed to say cat because that's what we sing in our alphabet song. C says cat, ka, ka, ka. But then it isn't. And the brain's a pattern-making machine. So what we just want to make sure is we're always making sense, that we're always making sense. So being able to give skills that would not necessarily be able to be taught um, with as much access or ease is key. Now, what we know about the brain and how we teach kids to read leaves us with a big hole. There's a giant gap, and I don't mean just the traditional gap we hear about now, which is, and I don't know how it ever happened, but you know, somehow along the way we forgot that you need the code to crack the code. You have to have the code to crack the code. Like how you could ever think that you could crack a code without having the code. Like the Naval, you know, the Navy would tell us right now that their Morse code operators actually do know Morse code or they wouldn't be responsible to retrieve the messages coming in and then give them to the captain or send messages. You have to have, you have to know three taps is an H in order to translate what that three taps is to either send, in other words, write, or to receive, in other words, to read. So that part's kind of a given. But when we look at the brain science on how the brain learns to read, we're not looking at the whole picture because there's a whole other layer of brain science on how the brain actually learns, the brain systems for learning, social and emotional engagement, curiosity-driven instruction. What makes us want to know something to start with? How does it connect? What does it mean? What are the doorways that we can make something go through given the learner that we're actually dealing with? Because unfortunately, the show that is reading that we're putting on, our audience is K, first, second, or struggling for one reason or another at upper grades. They're not necessarily the audience that is ready for a lot of the abstract terminology that can come with learning to read right now as we look at things with fricatives and nasalizations and diphthongs and triphthongs and digraphs and trigraphs. That information is wonderful for a teacher to have, but at the end of the day, the show you're putting on is for an audience that has their shoe in their mouth and they're licking the carpet. So, the tricky part is how do I bridge that? How do I take this now teacher knowledge that, again, depending on your state, you've either been in the middle of watching 60 hours of training because teachers need to know the code to teach the code, and we didn't get that in college. So how do we, though, take that body of knowledge and remember who we're doing this show for? These are kids that are concrete thinkers, and these are abstract concepts. So it's a real challenge, and teachers are feeling absolute overwhelm trying to figure out not just how to wrap their head around all these new concepts, but how to make this make sense to the kids they're actually teaching every day. And we've got fourth graders now that are reading like first graders because of the pandemic. And then you're really a fish out of water because if you're in fourth grade, you're not used to having to help cue a kid who can't read a word. I mean, that's you, you, you don't typically have to have a big bag of tricks to help kids learn how to read in fourth grade. You're used to reading to learn not learning to read, and having to do both simultaneously is not only incredibly taxing on the brain, but it's incredibly taxing on the teacher. <laughs> so we've got a lot going on right now, and we need some bridges to make this not just doable, but make it really happen, and happen easily and effectively with the most kids possible. 
And I think we sometimes can be moving in, in different directions on that. So patterning is the brain system for learning. So forget a side or forget a position or forget a you know, pendulum swinging here and there. Patterning is the brain system for learning. It always has been, it always will be. We have a hierarchy of likelihood, what we expect to try first, next, and if that doesn't work, then here's where we fall. So we tell kids though, this is how we're more in opposition than in alignment. We tell kids at the earliest grade, T says turtle, t -t -t -t. and then we proceed to show them a thousand and one examples of T not doing that ever, <laughs> ever, ever. Because if you pick up any book and you look on any page and you look on any line of any book on any page, guess what you'll see? <laughs> the, this, them, those, that. You'll, I was gonna say you'll see the T, but you won't be seeing it say T. You'll be seeing it say because every other word of those high frequency words is a T with an H. But do you know when that gets taught? Officially, formally, on a scope and sequence? First grade. That is like hitting the brain with a brick every single minute of every single day. Basically what it does is it slows down your ability to teach the T sound. Because the brain is throwing it out the door every time it sees it because it doesn't work. You're telling the kids when you sing the song, T says turtle, t -t -t. that's like saying, look, here's the tool. You can use that to do this. But then every time you go to do this, you don't use that tool. You use a different tool, but it's not one you've told them about yet. So it actually is harder to go slow. It's, it's harder to play with a puzzle when you have fewer pieces. It's easier to play with a puzzle when you have more pieces because they actually start to make sense and come together. When you hold all the pieces back and you only give the kid, I'm gonna give you three pieces of this 50 piece puzzle because then you'll be less overwhelmed. <laughs> what does he do with three pieces? He can't play with it, it doesn't make sense, it's not gonna fit, there's literally, and he's not gonna be motivated to get those pieces out and play with them either. And we do this though. Uh, traditionally, we do split the code into three parts and we divvy it out in bits and pieces across kinder, first and second, with the idea that by third grade, you're ready to read. You're gonna be wrapped up with a bow and delivered to third grade ready to read. But the truth is, even in a non-pandemic year, half of our third graders are still stuck on the hump between learning to read and reading to learn because developmental readiness means kids are all over the place in K-1-2. So they're not getting the deliveries at the exact time they're supposed to all together in sync. And a lot of kids get backed up, so when they hit third grade, they barely got what second grade was teaching. And it's not divvied out equally. Second grade bears the brunt of the bulk of all of it because kinder's so caught up just trying to teach those darn letter sounds. Because <laughs> that takes a whole year when you're trying to go through the front door and you're trying to teach those individual letter sounds. Some kids aren't ready to open that front door up and let you in and you have to just keep knocking and wait. You're really a slave to readiness. You've gotta wait till they're ready because no matter what show and dance you do, until they're ready, you can't get through that door. But the back door's wide open and there's even some suction power if you can just get them curious enough to peek through. So that's what we want. We wanna get through that back door that's so much more easy to, to access. And here's what's interesting. If you were to tell the kids, Johnny, Jimmy, how many times have I split you two up today? Oh, just, just in the last 20 minutes, how many times? Three, right, exactly. Do you know why? It's because every time you guys get together, you do something that you're not supposed to do. And there are two letters just like you guys. Every single time they get together, they do something they're not supposed to, which is they stick out their tongues and they go and that's the sound they make, which is why they're not allowed to sit together, but they don't listen any better than you two because anywhere you look, guess who you see? <laughs> side by side, they find their way back together just like you two. Now, I'm not gonna tell you again, split up. <laughs> now, that conversation could be had in any kinder or first grade classroom across the world on the very first day of school. And by the second day of school, if those kids came in, how quickly do you think they would be able to tell the teacher, they're not allowed to sit together. You told them three times yesterday they couldn't sit together and they're still sitting together. They all know who can't do what, why. They're so good at everybody else's business. Now they may not know that their names are Tommy and Timothy, but they know who they are and what they do. There's absolutely no difference with that. This is orthographic mapping in the brain if you, if you, if you cheat properly. In other words, if I, if I show this to a three-year-old, that three-year-old's gonna be able to go, he doesn't know what a T or an H even is, and he doesn't have to, to be able to see this and have a sound pop out. That's a really fascinating phenomenon when you think about the fact that we could give this to them on the first day of school before they even know what a letter is, and we don't. We make them wait a year to get it. And that makes the T harder to teach. Not to mention, doesn't give them a really powerful tool they're gonna need to make sense of any sentence they try to read at all for a year. Now having said this, let's say they don't know a T and they don't know an H, but I'm writing my morning message on the board. And even in kindergarten, you know, you write your morning message or it's, you look at the word Thursday on your calendar, it connects. Because when I'm pointing to that TH, my tongue's going 
it's connecting. Otherwise, you're pointing to the T, and they're going, the best kid in the class is going, ta, 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 and he's always wrong, because it's never making that sound. That's the opposite of the brain system for learning. That is slowing everything down and putting giant monkey wrenches in the path that we're trying to hit. So the, the key, really, when we talk about science of reading is we want orthographic mapping happening in the brain. We want sound to symbol connections instantly forged. Not instantly forged, but forged so as to be instantly accessible. You see a symbol, sound pops out. You hear a sound, you immediately have a way to know what to put down on paper to reflect that sound. That's what we're going for, and we can already have it. It's like Dorothy's shoes. We don't have to work for it. It's already there if we know how to use the brain for our purposes, instead of literally doing everything in complete defiance of everything we know about how the brain learns to read. And this is really a difference in leveling the playing field, because if you don't have a way to make something make sense, your alternative for acquiring that knowledge is repetitive, skill-based practice. And that's not a bad thing to have, I mean, structured, structured literacy lessons, structured phonics practice, spotlighting a specific pattern and making sure kids have every opportunity to own that. That's, that's a good thing. But it can't be the door that every kid has to be able to walk through to own the skill. Because we can't provide enough use it time for every kid. Every kid's got a different threshold for use it or lose it. Some kids can use it a couple times, it's theirs, they got it, they're good. And they got lots of support at home to keep using it, so it, it starts to connect and, and then it's something that they don't even think about anymore. Other kids could do it 300,000 times and on the next Monday it's like they never saw it before. And you're the only one using it, which means if it doesn't keep getting used, brain's gonna lose it over summer if nobody's reading with them, if nobody's going over all their words they have to know, they get these holes because they're not meeting the threshold of use it time. And if you really think about the trajectory of instruction, if you are a third grader reading at a first grade level, how much use it time can the third or fourth or fifth grade teacher provide on the first grade reading skills you don't have? Almost none compared to what first grade provided, and even then it wasn't enough to meet the threshold that you had for need. So the window closes on them as they make their way up higher and higher. The odds that they'll ever get back what they didn't get when they should have are, are are staggeringly against their favor. And that's where we have to have a way to fast track, to streamline, to really give more pieces of the puzzle sooner, to accelerate the code so that it can actually be used across the day. And we're, we're connecting with the brain system for learning. Now, this is my little ana analogy with the puzzle, but phonics is a puzzle. It's, there's nothing, I don't think, there's nothing more um, perfectly to connect with what phonics is, then I, I see it anyway, as a, as a puzzle. The pieces of the phonics code are like pieces of a puzzle. The more you have, the more sense it makes. The less you have, the less you can actually do with it. And you're not motivated to play with a puzzle that's half there. As a matter of fact, as teachers, we are hoarders, and we almost never throw anything away, but the one thing you probably do throw away are puzzles missing pieces. Because <laughs> you can't put a puzzle together that doesn't have all the pieces. What are you supposed to do with it? It's worthless. And it can feel like that to a kid trying to read or write and missing these big pieces. If your name is Howard, you can't wait until second grade to find out the owl sound, even though the OUOW is on second grade scope and sequence. Now, I am not saying, by the way, that a scope and sequence is not imperative for phonics. It is. Systematic, sequential, and explicit phonics instruction, that is a necessity. But that's for your program. The teacher's not the program. You know, the teacher is allowed to be responsive to what's actually happening, which is like, your name's Howard. And right now, based on what you know in kinder, you think your name's Ha'awa Arada. Because that's what it is if you know all your letter sounds. Ha'awa Arada. He needs two phonic skills to understand why his name's Howard. Otherwise, every time he goes to read his name or write his name, he's not actually getting to reinforce letter sound connections. He's just having to randomly memorize a rote sequence of letters that actually he doesn't hear. Just like Lily. She thinks she should have an E at the end of her name, but she doesn't. She has a Y that she doesn't hear. This happens constantly. So how nice it would be to have that OUOW on the scope and sequence because we want to check and balance. We want to make sure everybody knows that at the end of the day, you better at least be here so everything can be accounted for. But it doesn't mean that Howard can wait two years. And it's not just Howard. Every kid in the class who's going to have to read the word how, or now, or about, or flower, or around, every kid's going to need that sound because every kid's going to have to read and write those words. And it's so much power. And the neat part is they already have it because they know what they say when they get hurt. Ow! And that's exactly what happens when these two play together. Somebody always gets hurt. Whenever O, U, or O, W get together, they play so rough, somebody always gets hurt, and they go, ow! And that's the sound they make. But 
Flying overhead is Superhero O, because he is their all-time favorite superhero ever. And if he ever flies by, they will stop dead in their tracks, no matter what they're doing, and go, oh, 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 because they love him. Now, here's why that matters. Words like glow, flow, slow, blow. The brain is going to seek out the next most likely thing. Just like if you try to park outside and it's full, you're going to be like, I'm going to go around the back. You go around the back and it's full. Oh. All right, I'm going to try around the side. If that doesn't work, I'm going to go to your house. We're going to call an Uber. I'm not ruining another pair of shoes. we got to walk far enough once we get in the convention center. I am not walking all the way from the hotel to the parking lot. So we always have a next most likely backup. We, that's how we account for discrepancies. We have this hierarchy of likelihood. So with the code, which is what kids are eating and breathing all day long from the minute they start school, we want the brain to fall into this natural cycle of what it already does to work through the rest of behaviors all day long, which is most likely next, most likely all else fails. But it's got to align with what drives kids' behavior. That's really the difference, lining up with what kids already know, with what they already do, and then they can kind of hit the ground and run with it. The more pieces you have of a puzzle or of the phonics code, the more sense it makes and the more inclined you are to want to actually use it. Um, I love this next, I do not know why my clicker's acting funny, but I love this because this is a little TK student, which is between, and I promise I'm gonna bring this up to, the, to those upper grade guys, but she's between kinder and pre-K, so not quite ready for kinder, a little bit past where pre-K would be. She wanted to write about her vacation house. Now, I'll tell you how she got the why in a bit, because that's gonna be a high leverage piece that we're gonna look at even for words like hyperventilate and hypothesis. But, vocation. She did not have access to the word vacation house on your word wall, because who would have that word on the word wall, right? We've got like boy, girl, it, she, can, do, and like. She didn't want to use those words. She wanted to write about her vacation house, and so she did. She just built it with what she had. Now, it's not spelled correctly, because obviously we'd want the A-T-I-O-N, and that's its own phonics pattern or secret, which we'll talk about. But she had another way she could put it together. She had the K A. She knows that E Y A Y are too cool, like Fonzie, so they always stick up their thumbs and go A. And she knew the sh, and she knew in. And then for house, she had the h ow. S. Now she doesn't have enough text experience to know which one's right, so she picked O W instead of O U. But you know why I'm not worried at all about it? She's got that orthographically mapped in her brain already, which means she can read words like how, cow, now, about, flower, around. Once she starts doing that. Spelling is so much easier fine-tuned when kids are already reading. So reading is a better teacher than we are. It leaves very little manual labor left for us, especially if they're doing it two years before they should, which she is if she has something she's not supposed to get for two more years. Is it a problem that it's on the scope and sequence in second grade? No, because we have to have sequential instruction to ensure everything is taught. Do we have to wait until second grade to give her what she needs to actually do the job that a reader and a writer does starting as early as kinder? Absolutely not because we're the teacher and we're way smarter than our program. I mean, that's, we are like the doctor who knows you need penicillin here. Like, I can't have a week that I'm only allowed to prescribe penicillin if it's week 32 of month four. Like, that doesn't, well, there wouldn't be a week 32 of month four, but, <laughs> so, whatever I didn't say, just pretend that made sense, but it doesn't, you can't be told when to prescribe what, right? Like, you have to prescribe it because right now is where we need it. I was just in a district in Alabama and I was told that I was working with all their teachers, K-5, and the kinder teachers and the first grade teachers were part of the initiative that, that brought me there. And the kinder teachers, the couple days before, were told, well, you can't go because we, you know, we just checked in kinders. We really don't want kindergarten to teach digraphs. Now, the kindergarten teachers had to do just one thing to change the mind of the district, and that was to show them what their week one sight word requirement was. Want to guess what the word was that they had to teach on week one to their kindergartners? The. the. That was all it took. They said, so if we're not allowed to teach digraphs, how do you propose we actually do this word? Should we just look at it a bunch of times and hope it sinks in? Because <laughs> that goes against all the science, which we're actually going to look at. You should never be memorizing words you can actively decode, because it, it literally trains the brain to read wrong. And we can see where right hemisphere versus left hemisphere engagement um, is occurring when kids call words versus actively decode them. So as we look, and that actually science, that was science from 2015, so it was before science of reading even came about. And I used to try to use that to just convince everybody not to just go with memorizing words, because at the time you couldn't, you know, you could try to explain how phonics was so important, but it wasn't a given as an expectation. Now it's an expectation. So I don't have to convince anybody as much that it's important. Just common sense is such that if you own building blocks, you can make thousands of words. You have access to read and write everything, as opposed to just memorizing a word, and now you're limited with that piece, that one piece of a code that should have 
access to every word, every piece. So anyway, they got to come to the workshop, which was awesome. And the other thing they said was, what's more developmentally appropriate? Not getting along with someone and knowing how to be a little bit bratty and going <laughs> or having to have a word flashed at you 400 times so that you can memorize the word. And then the next week you flash a different word and you hope the kids who aren't reading at home have somebody at home that'll keep flashing those words because those are the kids who suffer. The kids who aren't getting to be read to at home, the kids who don't have books at home or don't have parents who speak the language that we're reading in, in the classroom. How are they gonna keep track of a bunch of words they could never read to start with, but that are only based on use it? If they're not using it, they're gonna lose it. And that's a given. Now, if, if we teach the reader and not the reading, it's invested in them. And it can continue to cycle throughout the day on road signs, billboards, commercials, or writing activities like this one. And we just basically can't wait three to four years for the whole code. Um, now, this is how this can look. And I'm gonna take this in a lot of different directions. Imagine it's day one. If you were in second grade, first grade, or kindergarten, your kids would not have the AUAW phonics pattern yet on your program. And again, we're not talking programs. Today we're talking about teacher tools to make sense of whatever your program might be. And your teacher program would not have introduced AUAW yet if it's the beginning of second grade, which is a shame because it's August. And to read the word August, you are gonna be looking at a bunch of letters that if a kid tries to attack it following the breadcrumb trail he's been taught so far, the word would be August. August. So when you sing your alphabet song, which typically in K-1-2, there's some sort of an alphabet song sung, you're probably singing A says apple, ah, 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 but it can also say acorn, A, 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 or some variation of those sounds for A. Which means you're gonna look like a big liar when you turn around and you point to an identical capital A over here and you say, come on guys, let's read the word. August. <laughs> that has nothing at all to do with what you just did over here. As a matter of fact, you made a sound that's not only not that letter sound, it belongs to a different letter that's not even in this word. So it's a real disconnect. And you're not gonna do that once, you're gonna do it 30 times. Because <laughs> every single day that you have in your classroom, you're gonna be singing your alphabet song in the morning and then showing them the exact opposite on the calendar five minutes later. Which basically means you're undoing all the work you're doing over here. Because <laughs> every time you work so hard to teach what A says, you are unteaching it when you turn to the left. And the brain is a pattern making machine, which basically means it's a good scorekeeper. Worked, didn't work, tie, still don't know. Worked, didn't work, tie, still don't know. So we're not making any headway with the individual sounds if we can't ever reinforce them in any of the actual reading that we're doing, and especially when it's this blatant. So imagine instead of having to say, it just is, it just does, you just have to remember, this word's August. Instead of that, you said, yeah, there's a secret. There's, and all the secret is this phonics pattern. But secrets make things important to kids. Phonics patterns do not. <laughs> there's a secret. See, Anytime a letter isn't doing what it's supposed to, like when letters get together with other letters, sometimes they make totally different sounds. So if you ever see a word and like the letters just aren't making the sounds you would expect, there's probably a grown-up reading secret in that word you don't know. Now the thing is, is grown-up reading secrets are big secrets and you can tell any grown-up you want because their brains are big enough to hold it. It's, you can't tell kids though, because if the secret's too big for a kid brain, the brain could explode and we don't want that to happen because that would be really bad. So, and by the way, that will set off your criers if you do teach in an early grade, so be careful that they know your sense of humor before you talk about the brain exploding. But what you wanna do is up the ante on this, because this is big kid stuff. Like, this is grown up stuff. Like, these are huge secrets. So I have to make sure you're ready before I tell you one. And this is a really key point, because secrets, there's neuro, there's a neuroscientist, her name is Mary Helen Amordino Yang. I have her up here. Not only do secrets make things important to kids, but they trigger a need to know. The need to know is what marks information for memory and prioritize learning in the brain. Without a need to know, if you teach something nobody asks for, nobody wants, nobody cares about, and they don't know what you're talking about, it's like throwing a ball to an empty field. There is no catcher in place to grab it. And even if they grab it, they don't know what to do with it, so it'll fall. After they'll just dump it, because why would you keep something you don't need? But if you can cognitively prime the brain, put a catcher's mitt in place before you toss it out, they've not only got a much better chance of capturing it, but they have a place to keep it so they can retrieve it. Even if all they say when they retrieve it is something like, hey, mom, guess what? There are letters that go, they don't, they can't sit together. And they go, and one of them is T, because I know, because my name is Tommy. I don't know the other one. But anyway, they always get in trouble because they go, and they don't listen. Now, that is not retelling a phonics pattern. 
That's Reed telling, to the best of his ability, something he remembered that connects with what he understands. He's only able to relate to the T because that's in his name. He doesn't even know what the other letter is. He doesn't know that the mom doesn't even know what he's talking about. But the, the, the amazing part is the hook that it's living on. It can live on a hook where there is no readiness academically for this skill yet, but he's got a way to keep it so that when he connects it with the fact that it's in this word, look, it's in this word. Look, guys, see this big book? Look, the word the T is not saying to. This word's not to. I think there's one of those secrets in this word. Who can tell me what it is? Like, it's making sense. Whenever he's ready to wake up and smell the coffee, what he's seeing is aligning with what he knows. And the hook that it can hang on until there's an academic readiness is this other thing that's important, this secret. And the secret isn't random and weird. It connects to what he already understands, which is if you misbehave, you can't sit together. So it all kind of circles back. Now, this is so, so, so important that when we teach something, we teach to a need to know. The trick is triggering a need to know with kids who all know different things. Some kids need to know something because their curiosity is such that they know, they're academically high, so they have all these questions and they're like the perfect kid to give you teachable moments. Other kids don't even know what you're talking about on a good day. So, you know, ignorance is bliss. If you don't know what you don't know, you don't have any questions. So how do you take all those different levels and trigger a need to know? And one way, I'm gonna show you a couple ways, but one way is with a secret. Secrets just are scarce, you're not supposed to have them, which means you want them. Now this teacher, by the way, does a really good job at drumming up, as a matter of fact, the best job I've ever seen, at drumming up the need to know of her students. And hopefully she will play. Huh, okay, it should be playing. Hopefully that sound will come out. To fourth graders? There we go. Fourth graders? <gasps> oh my. To third graders? Don't know the secrets. Don't know the secrets. What? The second graders don't know the secrets. Oh my God! The first graders don't know the secrets. <laughs> you are the first kindergartners I've ever told these secrets to. Now, could you imagine if instead she just said, "Open to page 11. We're going to look at our controlled vowels." Like that, that totally different, and yet it's the same thing. It's the same thing, it's just going in a different pathway. It's going through a pathway that's already familiar, it's already built, it's functioning at an, ex at an expert level. It's, these, it's the social, emotional, feeling-based networks that we all share. They're part of our human experience of understanding the framework of what drives our behavior every single day. Being in love, and oh, this is the secret, by the way. There are two letters in the word August that are head over heels in love. I mean, like, huge crush on each other. And they get so embarrassed anytime they have to stand, like, right together in a word that they always put their heads down and they say, ah, and that's the sound they make. And it's not just in the word August, but look over here, ah, look over here, uh, awful, look at this word, hydraulic, if you're in third grade. <laughs> look at this word, um, look at his name tag, Austin. Look at all the words that have this grown up secret. Now if you didn't know the secret, you'd think this word's awful, or that word's awesome, or you'd call him Austin. See, now you know the grown up reading secret. Now that's such an important thing to do if it's August. If it's not August, there's no super high value attached to that particular phonics skill. But if it is August, you're not gonna get very far on teaching them what A says if you don't account for, and when it doesn't, here's why. It just sets the stage to be able to start making sense of why things you say may not always look the way they expect them to. For upper grade kids, you've gotta plug holes at lightning speed, because they should have had all of this yesterday. And as they're looking at their on-grade level curriculum across any content area, there are these opportunities to take a five-second detour just to give meaning to something that otherwise has none. When you can do that, you can skip a lot of steps in terms of the repetitious skill-based practice, because the practice will come in automatically as you use it to read and write. We're using it to read and write constantly. So we just have to have it to read and write with is the problem. And we don't have time for doubling that practice, at least not when we don't have to, not if we can get that jump start. Now, as we kind of look at the different ways this can apply and be used, I wanna mention another way to trigger need to know. And you saw me do it when I made that weird voice and I leaned to the left and I went, ah! And I wanna say something about that because that is novel instruction. Anytime you use an extreme body gesture or a weird vocal inflection, or even if you just line up by going, you know, anything that's out of the norm, your brain will instantly attend to, to account for the discrepancy. And in that moment that it's taking, that's a heightened need to know moment. 
which means you are on full alert and you are taking in information in a way that's much more concentrated than when you're just hanging out and looking around the room. And the best proof of this is I was doing a PD and it was at a school district, K-5. I had K-2 in the morning, I had 3-5 in the afternoon, and one of the teachers in the summer, because it was summer, brought her daughter who had just turned four. And she had nowhere else to be, no sitter, so she stayed with us the whole afternoon, very well behaved, played on her mother's phone the entire time. She only looked up one time. And it was when she had a need to know. And her need to know was connected to the fact that as I was talking about this little grouping of letters, I was saying how they were in love and they had this big crush on each other and they went, Ah, and I had my hands together and I was wiggling and my voice went up and the little girl went like this. She went. And then she got out of her seat and got on her tippy toes to look at me all the way from the floor up back up to my head. And her need to know is this. Did she just have a stroke? Is she going to the hospital? Are the men going to come with the loud truck and the siren? She was trying to account for what in the world I was doing. And as she was trying to account for it, she was taking everything she could in to try to make sense of it. Now, as soon as I started sounding normal again and went on with the conversation, she lost interest and went back to her mom's phone. So it was only about seven seconds of heightened state of alert focus. So an hour later, I went up to this little girl after our break and I said, could you tell me what these letters say? Her mom said, she doesn't know any letters yet, she just turned four, she only knows the letters in her name and she doesn't even know those except that like what they, she doesn't know what they say, she just knows what they are. So this is just an experiment. So could you tell me what these letters say? And the little girl went exactly like this. She went, ah! She turned her head the same way I did. She moved her body like I did and her voice sounded like mine. Now she wasn't thinking lip position, tongue position, mouth shape. I need to first segment the sound from the words August, awesome, awful. So that it would be ah, oh, ah, oh, is that proper, is that correct? Like, none of that, because none of the higher level processing was even in place yet, at all. She just had a feeling that landed her in a sound. That's, that's a connector piece, that's a way to pull it to retrieve it. We've got, and she doesn't even know what the letters are. We've got kids that are in upper grades who've been working in a resource classroom every single day for a week and they couldn't instantly off the top of their tongue see this and have the sound pop out. And that's what we want. That's what orthographic mapping demands is instant sound symbol connection. Now is she ready to take this and run with it for the purpose it's taught, which is to read and to write with it? Of course not but she owns it, it's there. Now, if I'm her teacher, I'm gonna use this key until the cows come home. I'm gonna be taking advantage of this every time I see a place to put the key. If we have spaghetti sauce for lunch, we're gonna be talking about seeing that secret. If I have an Austin in my classroom, if we read Alexander and the Terrible, awful, horrible, no good day, every chance I get, I'm gonna show her by modeling the power that comes with owning a piece of the code, with owning this key. It doesn't have to happen after they know what the letter names are. This can happen simultaneously. As a matter of fact, I will tell you now, it will take them longer to learn that T says T if you're using muscle memory, and that's the fastest way there is to do it, but that's like a tennis lesson. It doesn't happen instantly. Your body's doing it. It's getting into your lips, tongue, and teeth through repetitious um, use. So it takes two weeks, to at least two weeks, two a month. This you walk right out the door with because it already is known. So they'll know how to respond to this before they'll know how to respond to the T, and that's okay. So I'm not saying like teach this first, I'm saying they're both equally important. You need both to read and to write. You need as much of the code as you can have, as quickly as you can have it, and aligned with what developmentally makes sense for where you are. Now if you don't speak any English at all, guess what, this is still equally as easy, because this is something we all do. <laughs> so that's another piece as we wanna hook kids, all kids, even if they're not five, they might be 50. You know, we've got adult ed that can't read either. And the more sense something can make, the, less, the more tolerant they are to try to pick it up. They're the least tolerant of things that don't make sense, are adults. Because their attitude is just tell me how you know. And they expect us to have a way that we know, and, and we don't. Now, I was gonna say one more thing. At the end of the workshop, we reversed this process. And I put this on a wall, actually a chalk tray, with about 10 other ones. And I asked the little girl, could you go point to the letters that go And she was able to take the sound and identify the culprit that made it. That's what a writer would have to do. You have to hear the sound and know what your choices are to maybe put that down to encode it, to write the word. So having the ability to, I wasn't trying to teach, she wasn't trying to learn. She just looked up at the perfectly wrong or right moment, however you want to look at it, and she got stuck with this whether she likes it or not. And that's the beauty of non-conscious learning. And all non-conscious learning really is, is tapping into something kids already know. Because the way to cheat, use it or lose it, is to glue something new to something already deeply entrenched in their understanding. And then one gets to live right next to the other. So if there's a restaurant you really want to go to and you are horrible with directions, but I tell you it's right behind where your grandma used to live. Poof, it's yours forever. 
Even if you don't even like the restaurant, you can't get rid of knowing where the restaurant is because it's stuck next to something you've known and could find in your sleep. So it's such a, it's such a 180 degree shift from how we typically would have to approach skills that have no meaning which is why they're so difficult to teach. Now, the way this looks in the brain is that the brain develops back to front. So the earlier developing areas of the brain that we're tapping into are these social, emotional, feeling-based networks, which is in the mid-rear part of the brain. The higher level executive processing center is in the front. That continues to develop until kids are in their mid-20s. It is absolutely not the easiest door to get through on a given day for any learner. Add language differences to it, add background or experience base, add, add support, home support, even add attention span. There's so many obstacles or landmines that can interfere with the, the ease of getting through that front door, that higher level processing. Now, that doesn't mean that the information we front load or back load, because it's coming through the back, doesn't have to transfer to the higher level processing center. It does. For a kid to see the connection between the and the word the, that transfers. It has to transfer for them to go the, 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 the that one, no, that word, I can read that word. That happens because they were able to take what they knew and apply it to what they see. And that's gonna be different for every kid. That's not an issue. That's not something we have to worry about because there's ample opportunity across the day as we read and write for them to see this happening. What we just wanna make sure is nobody's not getting these skills and that everybody has enough to actually do something across the day to take advantage of the reading and writing that we're, that we're giving them. Because I really don't see much value taken away from the reading and writing happening in the grade level years where they don't have the code to read and write with yet. I see a lot of boxes that get checked and a lot of exposure that's happening, but the actual experience can't happen because you don't have what you need to reinforce what you're doing. You, you don't have the code to write with. It's like puzzle practice without the puzzle. It's very difficult. So if we look at this and we can see that we want to hit these more um, earlier developing and more easily accessible areas, then we have to cheat. And brain plasticity really gives us a great roadmap to do this. Uh. And here's how. Automatically, we will activate social and emotional centers when there is some sort of a connection that is emotional or behavioral driven. Phonics skills, by default, like math, I mean, it's not going to trigger your, your, you know, your humor or your sadness. It's, it's abstract. So we have to cheat. We have to wrap it up with some sort of a social emotional disguise, like being in love, not, like not getting along, like playing rough and getting hurt and saying, ow, like being sneaky and knowing that when you're in the back of the line, you're going to get away with more than when you're at the front of the line. Things that drive our behavior on a daily basis are typically behavioral driven or feeling based. So if we can just connect or pair abstract skills with what kids understand or have experienced in their five years, six years, or however many years they've been around, we have this, this automatic in that we can offer them that, it, that goes beyond where some of their deficits may lie, especially if they have deficits. Upper grade struggling readers typically do struggle with very similar things regardless of what their identification is. Working memory, cognitive processing, um, uh, developmental readiness is more early, early grade specific, but it certainly lends itself to having all of these same issues. Auditory discrimination and auditory processing, articulation, everything to do with language is one of the, the biggest um, obstacles that kids who struggle with reading face. I mean, language is right there connected with every aspect of what reading is. All of those are front door mechanisms. None of those affect how you feel when kids won't play with you on a playground. You feel sad when your friends don't want to be with you. None of those affect how you feel when it's your birthday and you get to be the line leader. You know to be happy, not because you're cognitively processing that information, because the experience is making you happy. So we all have this kind of leg up when it comes to hitting those frameworks of human understanding and just, just gluing what isn't naturally there. Um, so this is kind of how we're, we're sneaking through these social emotional superhighways. Imagine, instead of looking at page 13 in your workbook on our controlled vowels, Imagine that you showed this instead, or at least paired this with the workbook page on our controlled vowels. ER, IR, and UR love to go riding in cars, but they are terrible, awful, horrible, no good drivers. They don't even have driver's licenses, and they always have to slam on the brakes and say, Now you'll have access to download everything that you're seeing or that I'm holding up, so you'll be able to have that anchor and, and play with doing this in your class. But what I loved, by the way, is you laughed. Laughing means we had multiple areas engaged simultaneously in the brain, because laughter is a higher level um, um, 
outcome. It's something that happens because you have an advanced intelligence that's triggering multiple areas of awareness to come together and find something humorous. So when we look at multi-sensory learning and we talk about see it, say it, do it, there's a feel it that's much more important than any of those things. You can't forget what you feel. You can, we can forget what we learn, but it's hard to forget what we feel. So getting laughter means we have accomplished one thing that's so important, which is we know that we've engaged multiple areas of the brain simultaneously. And what we also know, based on neural scan imaging, so it's not a philosophy, there's no pendulum that can swing, it's science. The more areas engaged and the more widespread those areas are, the deeper the learning. So the more pings you can get on the brain radar as you toss out a skill, the more deeply connected that is and more easily able it will be to be retrieved and the less likely it is to disappear. The less pings you get, the less areas that go, oh, I know this, like that's what we're really looking for. We're looking to do something that's gonna trigger an awareness, an activity, a response in as many areas as possible. Workbook page 37, or 17, or 12, or whatever the number was, that's only gonna give you one ping and only among the kids who know the sound of the art controlled vowels and are recognizing some words on that page. The kids who don't speak English well, or who are three years behind, who don't know how to read those words, or maybe they know those words, but they don't know the phonics pattern that's in them, they're not pinging. They're not giving you what you need, which means you're gonna be doing that a lot of times to get the ping. There's gonna have to be many, many repetitive opportunities for them to start connecting that information and not, not have it go away. We don't have enough time to make those pings because kids are already three years behind in reading a lot of them. So you're already working against the clock three years in the wrong direction. So we don't have the time to to run everybody through the longest possible course. We need to get them reading and writing. The faster they can start reading, the faster they start learning how to read, because reading is the best teacher, but you have to have the code to crack the code. So it's, it's really, neuroscience gives us this, this perfect place to go. This little girl could take those teacher's jobs, and it is her third day of kindergarten. Her mom was at a workshop just like this. It was a state-required school improvement workshop, and it was the first week just before the first week of school, mom went back home, told dad what she learned. I had them for a full day, not just an hour. Um, and in telling dad, she was at the table with her pre-K sister. And after dinner, they went out and played school. And mom heard all this noise. And she went out and filmed this. And then she tweeted it, and then she tagged me in it, which is how I got to hear and find this out. So this is her, totally taking this on her own. She even adds a public service announcement at the end. This is not a phonics skill in her brain. This is living somewhere completely different but it's still anchoring the same information. Ugh, my clicker is just gonna skip slides and... Hi kids, do you wanna know about the secrets about these? So E-R-I-R-U-R, -R -R. when they get together, they hop in their cars, they drive crazy and they say, nothing to do with page 36 in my workbook like that is that is being anchored by so many different things that she's experienced in her five years on earth that skills not going anywhere now I don't know if she's ready to use it to read yet you know why I don't know if she knows her letter sounds if she doesn't know the, the letter H for example she might be able to see a word like her and go look as all kids will all kids in your class will be able to let's say look at this and then slide across your floor as they kick five people in their path and go, Aah! they'll all be able to do that. That will not be a problem. Application of it to read or to write is where everybody's gonna be a little bit different based on where they are and their readiness. If she knows the H sound, she might be able to go, her, 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 hey mom, I can read that word, that word's her. But if she doesn't know the H sound, all she's gonna be able to do is go, er, or let's say she only knows the H sound. Then all she can do is go, huh, er. It takes two to tango. She's gotta have both. If you have both, things are popping off everywhere. Billboards, road signs, commercials, magazines, newspapers. And it's not hard. It's not hard at all. It's actually so much easier. Because she's going to have to know the word her in kinder. But you know how normally it's taught? Because E-R-I-R-U-R is taught at the end of first or second, depending on your scope and sequence. Do you know how she's normally going to have to read the word her? Lots of flashcard practice. It's going to be a heart word. It's going to be a word you memorize by heart. Why would we memorize by heart something that's so easily gotten and on the third day of, of kindergarten why why would we wait two years to have something that's so high powered for kids there's no reason to wait no reason at all now vowels I'm gonna skip through a few things but I do want to say there are certain buckets kids understand kids understand as do 
others across the world that superheroes have power and they have a disguise and there's always a villain like a Lex Luthor who wishes he could take their power and he's always trying to strategize against them. There's certain things we understand that are hallmarks of these, these familiar frameworks. So the vowels are superheroes. They have a power no other in the letter, no other letter in the alphabet has. They can say their name, but they also have a disguise where they have these like little short and lazy like disguises they wear to duck down out of sight so nobody recognizes them. And when they do this, it gives kids a way to know both sounds for vowels instantly. And then I'll show you how they know which way they're going to go. But for example, U likes to pretend that he's, a, he's not paying attention because that way no one suspects who he is. So every time the teacher calls on him, he'll go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And that's his short and lazy disguise because when he's trying to duck down and stay out of sight, no one suspects he's a superhero when he never knows the answer to a question. Ah, uh, but that's not coming from talking about lip position, tongue position, and mouth shape for a schwa sound. It's coming from a feeling that generates automatically a sound regardless of how you may or may not be able to auditory process, auditorily process the vowels. Because kids who don't have strong auditory processing have a hard time distinguishing between ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You're not getting a lot of visual information, can't see what's going on in their mouth, and they might not be able to articulate. Maybe they can hear it, but they can't control their mouth muscles well enough to give you the proper variance between vowels, which means vowels are usually taught last. Or if not taught last, learned last, because they're the hardest. But you can't read a single word without a vowel, because there's no such thing as a word without a vowel. <laughs> so they're like the high-powered tool in the tool chest that kids have to wait the longest for because the brain won't cooperate, because the brain requires a higher level of development to acquire, to hear, to discriminate, to articulate those sounds. We don't want to wait. We can't wait, not if we're going to be reading and writing from day one. So we got to go through the back door connect it to something they understand. So while they're trying to pull it, it's not coming from their weakest points, lip position, tongue position, auditory capability. It's coming from not knowing the answer to a question. Ah, uh, poof, there it is. Shorty pretends she's a little old lady, pops an old bun on her head, pretends walking around and like interrupts conversations, pretending that nobody could ever suspect that she's a superhero. Eh? What'd you say? Eh? And that's her short and lazy sound. You'll see all the others on your download, but I know our time is rapidly disappearing, so I want to get to a bigger point. It is of no help to know vowels can be long or short if you don't know how to know which way they're going to go. Because you can't try both all the time. And in multisyllabic words, upper grade teachers will tell you, a lot of kids have no idea. If they see a word like, you know, hypothesis or phosphorus or hyperventilate, they don't have any way to know when they see a vowel whether to go long or short. As a matter of fact, most often, if they don't already know the word, they just stare at you and wait for you to tell them what the word is. They don't plow through it because they don't own the building blocks. The easiest way to know which way the vowel is going to go is something kids already do anyway, which is look for mom or anybody else in charge. If mama E is one letter away from another vowel, she would tell that vowel, you say your name. And by darn it, you will, because I'm only one letter away. I can get a hold of you, reach over her head, and make you say your name. So that's easy. If mama E is not there, the word bike would turn into bic. Or let's look at a word like butter. Mama's there, but she is two letters away. Her little arms aren't that long. She can yell and scream all she wants, but her little arms can't reach over both of those T's, which is why that U gets to be short and lazy, and that word's butter. If Mama E were one letter away, butter would turn into buter pretty darn fast, because she'd be able to reach them. So it's a fast, easy way for kids, both for spelling and for reading, to have a way to know which way the vowel's going to go. And because there's not always a pretty little E at the end, kids have to have another way to take it up a notch. And one thing they understand is if mom or dad is not around, a babysitter comes. If the teacher's not there, a sub comes. So guys, if you see any vowel that's one letter away from another vowel, that's the babysitter. It's doing just what mom would if she were there. It's telling that vowel that's one letter away, you say your name. And just like you listen to mom, you're gonna have to listen to Uncle Fred too. Same idea. So a word like making, a word like motor, a word like um, hibernate. Anytime you have a vowel one letter away from another vowel, that's just the babysitter. It gives kids a way to know which way the vowel is going to go. And let's say it's a word like have. You know, have didn't work, right? Because have should behave. Okay, you only got two things that it can say. What else could it be? Try the other one. What I like to say is sometimes mom's there, but she's just too tired to care. <laughs> she's, just, she's just tired. You know, moms get tired too. So sometimes mom's right there, but she's just too tired to care. So that vowel can do whatever it wants. But you've only got two options. So there's where the critical thinking comes in. There's where the active decoding comes in. Try the other sound, and you're going to hit it every time because it's really not hard when you own these building blocks. This little guy is going to tell you about, and actually, do I, do I have, am I correct that I am supposed to be out of time or not? Is it, what time do you guys have? Because mine's clock is counting, but it's not a real clock. Can you guys tell me what time you have? 
Twelve eighteen. Okay, so I'm supposed to be out of time, minus three. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to so skip ahead Molly here to the e ending point that I want to really hit I and wrap up with, because these are all things you can access. These are kids that you're going to see talking about how they know in kinder. Like this is a little ELL guy in kinder, and the explanation of who he is and where he came from is on the slide before. But he's talking about how he knew the sound to make for the A and the word making. Um, or how he knew that in hibernate that he was going to say I and not it. And it's, a, it's to hear it explained by me is one thing, but to hear it explained by kids is a whole other whole other thing. This is the Lex Luthor of the alphabet. This is Sneaky Y. He found out about the superhero vowels and he was mad. He hates the sound. He thinks yet is the ugliest sound on the planet. So he decided to be sneaky. He snuck into the closets of superhero E and superhero I and he took one of each of their capes, which is their, where their powers lie. So now when he's at the end of a word and he doesn't think anyone can see him, he will always be wearing either his E or his I cape so that he can use their powers to say their name, like Mom E, Daddy, Candice, G I, July. When he's at the beginning of a word, he's like a line leader. He does just what he should. Yeah, yeah, yellow, yes, you. Yeah, yeah. He's only sneaky when he's at the end or hidden between other letters and he doesn't think he can be seen. Now, if you're wondering about words like they play or today, hold that thought for a minute because that's, that's not sneaky why. But think about how kids maneuver in a line. Where do they behave best? Where do they always do exactly what they should? When they're the line leader. Where do they act up, get in trouble, and almost always have to pull a ticket? <laughs> when they're the caboose. You can get away with murder back there. Nobody can see anything you're doing. Or if you're between other letters, like in the word hypothesis. Why is the Y saying I? Well, of course he's going to be sneaky there. He knows he can't be seen. He's hidden between other letters. It gives kids a way to make the best betting odds for words they haven't seen before. That's really important because that letter Y is everywhere. And you know what it never does? Say yeah. Other than words like yellow, yes, you, or yak, good luck finding the Y, making the one sound we tell them to in kinder, in first, and in second, because positional sounds of Y is one of the hardest phonic skills, and it's not taught till the end of second grade. And it's everywhere. My, by, July, Thursday, May, um, candy, mommy, daddy are our favorite words, the boys' bathroom, it's everywhere. So kids have to have a way to make sense of it or think how much memorizing they're having to do. Now, these best betting odds for Las Vegas are teaching the reader, not the reading. You're giving the, the value to the kids so they can attack any word, even words they've never even seen before, not teaching the reading. And then, of course, I already mentioned at the very beginning about how EY, AY are just too cool, so they always stick up their thumbs and go, A, and that's the sound they make. Um, although, EY is just a little cooler, which is why he has a whole other sound he can make, which is E. So on your little clip that you download, you can see this, this Fonzie teacher helping all the young people who don't know who Fonzie is understand who Fonzie is. Um, and what all this does is it just lets kids strategize, critically analyze, think through, follow a breadcrumb trail, make sense of, plow through unfamiliar text. And it's so important that they do that. This brain study that we're going to wrap with, this is a Stanford brain study. This is the genesis for what is the science of reading because it shows in a clear scan what happens when kids call words versus actively decode them. When kids recognize words, they're activating the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is where weak readers show engagement. So when we look at third, fourth, and fifth graders who are weak readers, we see engagement on the right hemisphere. That's where you try to recognize words. The left hemisphere is active decoding. That's where kids are actually working through the sounds they know to figure out the words. High skilled readers at upper grades show engagement on the left hemisphere when they're actively decoding words. So Stanford, when they came out with a study, decided to tell all the teachers, hey, you guys are memorizing in some states 300 sight words before kids are allowed to get to second grade. So now you know, just never have kids memorize words they could just read. So this will save you guys tons of time because now you won't have to, kids mem have, to have kids memorize words anymore. What they didn't realize is we're not doing it for fun. <laughs> they were memorizing words because those words had phonics skills in them that we hadn't taught yet. So the reason they were having to memorize so many words is they couldn't read any of them. But we're kind of still in the same boat, not because we don't now know we don't want to memorize sight words. We want kids to actively decode. But what about the code they don't have yet? How are they supposed to read the word how or she or her or the? Those are still sight words. Those are not sight words. Those are considered heart words until you have taught it. But you can teach it before your scope and sequence does. If you had a way to make sense, for instance, of the ah sound, now they can just read the word awful or saw. If you had a way to make sense of the er sound, now they can just read the word circle, turn, or her. You don't have to wait because you can give them the information they need now so that they never have to memorize a word. Memorizing a word actually would be 10 times harder. And a principal actually said this at a conference. He was a man, and I always feel badly for men in my session, so I'll apologize to all the men now. I talk so fast, my husband says he has no idea how anybody can follow anything I say, but it's really not all my fault. It's because I only had an hour, but it's partially my fault because I do talk fast anyway. 
But this principal said at the, it was at the NAESP conference, and he said, let me just make sure I get what you're saying. You're saying then, basically, that it's like the old adage of if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime, and the sight word is the fish, right? <laughs> And I thought that's perfect. So for every guy out there, like that's hopefully that makes it. That's what we want. We don't want one fish. We want any fish. Give me any fish and I know what to do with it. And here's where I promise I will wrap up and end. This was from a teacher who's British and she teaches Syrian refugees. And she sent this and she posted it in the group and I just thought it was so perfect for today to wrap it up. She said, I teach Syrian refugees in the Ukraine. Most have been in the country three to four years and have had some English lessons. They've been taught uh, the silent E, magic E controlled uh, I cannot even see my own thing, controlled, oh, open syllable, closed syllable rule many times with no effect as they see no connection between magic letters and the sounds vowels make. But when I told them that the vowels had a secret and that they were actually superheroes with the power to say their name or be short and lazy and that Mommy E, if she were nearby, would uh, always tell them what to do, the light bulbs went off. She said, one of my students still holds his superhero arms up when he sees Mummy E or a babysitter vowel one letter away to remind himself that the vowel will be long, and he is 33 years old. <laughs> but who cares? He's a better English reader because of it. I also introduced Mommy E to my high-level class, uh, to my high-level class whose reading isn't too bad, along with a few other secrets, and with just those few, I could hear them quietly making the sounds to try and decode words instead of memorizing them or guessing them. The strategies aren't like anything I found in textbooks because they're intuitive and based on feelings and experiences we all share, even on opposite sides of the world. Everything has a reason, a story, a champion, all connecting back to pictures that make them make sense and give easy access, um, even if you don't speak English. Uh, even though my students are all adults, they still love hearing stories because we all do. Stories bind us together. Stories are a cultural way of thinking and passing everything we know down and we can tell stories to anybody and hook everyone of all ages. Um, she said, uh, they never tire of, of telling and retelling them to help each other sound out new words, and now the best part is they're telling them to their children. So stories are a great equalizer, and there's never any harm in telling a story. You can read Snow White with no fear of it being developmentally inappropriate. It's just a story. So these don't have to be skills. They can be a story. But just do keep in mind, stories should always go back to what we know, because those are the best ways to navigate the unfamiliar terrain, not kings and queens and weird folks that jump in a boat with a bat and do straight, those are different kinds of stories because those stories, to help you remember something, you gotta remember the story first. You wanna go with the easiest, most streamlined path, which is what drives kids' behavior every day. That's what's gonna trigger these social and emotional areas to engage. That's what's gonna line up with what they already know, and that's what lets them have a, a huge leg up on things they've never even seen before, which for text is everything because they've, ne they've never seen any of it. So all of this to say, thank you so much. I'm sorry I went over. I hope that you will uh, continue the conversation with me in the Facebook group. And um, thank you for also walking the mile that I know you had to walk to get out here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask, because I don't think there's anyone here after me. So thank you. <sighs> I feel like it's been an